Uh, my name is Gary McNichol, and um, I'm the co-founder of Growthbook. Uh, anyone familiar with Growthbook at all? A little bit. Um, so Growthbook is the most popular open source experimentation and feature flagging platform. Uh, a little bit hard to tell that. Whoa. Um, went through Y Combinator in 22, and um, previously I was a CTO and had a product at a company called education.com, where we did a lot of experimentation. Um, really like hiking, that's me and the Sierras. Um, so in building Growthbook, we spoke to literally hundreds of companies that do experimentation well, experimentation at scale. And one of the questions I always like to ask them is, how many tests do you run? Um, and the answers we got varied very widely, right? So we spoke to one major financial institution, you probably all have their accounts in your pocket. Um, and they were very proud of their experimentation program, and they ran three to five tests a year. Um, pretty impressive numbers. Uh, and then we spoke to a very large social network, and they were at the entire other end of that spectrum, right? So um, they were in the order of 50 to 60,000 simultaneous experiments, right? And that's a pretty broad spread, and both of those companies think they do experimentation well. Um, I know G10 is, what, 2,000? We got a way to go. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so there's a pretty big difference between running experimentation uh, for five users and 50,000, right? And so this talk is going to go over uh, why companies do A-B testing and then sort of why do they want to run at scales of sort of 50, 60,000 tests. Um, and then we're going to go over uh, some of the practical implications of running a program at that kind of scale. Um, Cool. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm, I'm going to probably switch between experimentation, A-B tests, testing. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, they're all the same. So uh, just ignore that. Um, so everyone, anyone not familiar with A-B testing? Everyone is familiar with A-B testing? All right, so I'm going to fly through this part. Um, uh, A-B testing is a great way of measuring the impact of changes on real users. Um, so basically what you do, you start with a hypothesis, you split your users, there's um, Hopefully you do that randomize, uh, and then you assign different variants. You then track how they behave through your app, and use statistics to figure out the impact of those changes. Um, cool. So uh, let's take a couple look at some live examples. So this is from uh, Airbnb, and the metric they're trying to improve. Anyone from Airbnb here? No? OK, cool. So we're all set. Um, the metric they're trying to improve <laughs> is uh, bookings and trying to reduce the cancellation rate by being more clear about the cancellation policies. So they put this little um, lifeline, a kind of timeline of when you can cancel, right? Um, so raise your hand if you think the new variant improved the booking rate. Raise your hand if you think it decreased the booking rate. Ah, some skeptical people. All right, cool. Um, that one actually did lose. Um, not entirely clear why. I don't work at Airbnb. Um, this is from a website called goodui.org. Uh, if you'd like to get some inspiration on tests that work that are detected in the wild, good UI is a good way, place to do that. Um, next example is from Netflix. So on the left side is their homepage, where they have uh, a button that says Try Now. And when you click it, it goes to a modal page where you can enter your registration information and sign up for an account. Now, they then tested uh, entering your email address before you can actually go to that modal. Um, raise your hand if you think that improved, presumably, sign up rates. How many think it decreased sign-up rate? Ah, interesting. Um, that one actually won. Um, and you probably are all like, you should never add fields unnecessarily, right? Or at least without context. Um, but for them, maybe that email address is more valuable than the full registration. They can target to them. So maybe they figured out that ROI is actually kind of positive from that. I don't know. I don't work at Netflix. So um, this, again, is from goodui.org. Um, Anyway, OK, so cool. So some of you hopefully got not everything right. Seems like most people got about 50%. Um, what do we think the average success rate of an A-B test? And so just to clarify, what, um, what a percentage of A-B tests are successful in improving the metrics with which they were intended to change? I'm sorry, what, was yell a little bit louder? 32%. What was that? I mean, you always learn something, so 100%. 100%. That's, that's very clever. Yes, I like that. Um, okay, so anyone think it's over 50? Anyone think under 50? Under 30? That's a couple of people. Under 20? 
there's a couple of people that have done this before. Um, OK, so the actual percentage for like a non-optimized product is about 30%. So it means that of the change we ship to production, about 30% of the time it actually improves metrics with which it was intended to move. And about 2 thirds of the time it does nothing or actually hurts your product. Um, this number is actually a high estimate, because if your product gets more optimized, this number gets harder to reach. Um, so here's some industry-wide numbers. This is from uh, Microsoft, Bing, and uh, Booking.com, and things like that. So the, you see the rates are much lower. So typically, it's around about 10 to 15%. Um, I think Optimizely did a big longitudinal study. They found, I think it was 12% was sort of their average um, across their companies. Um, cool. So uh, one of the other things to think about is that uh, nobody tests a feature they think will lose. Right? So all of these tests, people, somebody thought would win, and yet we're still only successful a third or less of the time. Right? So what are you supposed to take away from that? Right? That's pretty crazy, because like, we're professionals. People get paid to produce product, to pre predict what their users want. And it turns out we're actually pretty poor at estimating the value of ideas. Um, and yeah, so a lot of big companies kind of realize this. And so they kind of learn some intellectual humility when uh, evaluating new ideas, right? Um, so you kind of default to kind of test it rather than committees. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. So um, the other thing that, like, you have to do experimentation. Because if you're, if you're not experimenting, you have no idea of the impact. And it turns out two thirds of the time, you're actually going to be hurting your metrics. So um, you might be seeing those numbers and getting pretty depressed, like, wow, there's no point in testing because it's just terrible. But if you're not testing, you're, it's still happening, right? You're, not, you're just putting your head in the sand, basically. Um, so the, what I like to say is that without testing, you're guessing. Um, and big companies have figured this out and have integrated it into their, their programs. Um, one thing that big companies do, and I think we heard a little note over there on on sort of 100% on learning. So they try to reframe the, the win-loss discussion. And one of the things they do is uh, instead of win-loss, they'll actually uh, reframe in terms of how often do we make the right shipping decision, right? And in that context, you're actually making the right shipping decision about two-thirds of the time on average, maybe a bit higher. Because not shipping a losing product is a win. Um, so for some examples of that, uh, and they often use the term saved. I don't know, does, does eBay have a term for this? Yeah. Learned? Cool, like that one. Um, so just for by example, like if you test out feature Y, you then run an A-B test, purchase rate is down 7%. Well, not only have you, by not shipping that, you've saved 7% of your purchase rate, but you've also saved whatever development time you're going to be investing in feature Y that doesn't work. Um, OK. so. Cool, so that's why companies run A-B tests. Let's look at why they run so many A-B tests. Um, it turns out that the impact per experiment is likely small, uh, usually on the kind of 2 to 5%, depending on your scale. Um, so the average experiment impact is actually pretty small. And given that we already know that the probability of success of just running experiments at all is, is low, you're kind of left with two multiplying low percentages. Um, and so the way to compensate for that is actually run a very, very high volume of experiments. And that way you maximize your chances of getting um, a successful experiment. And you can able to see cumulative impact of your experimentation program over, over time. Um, and so the other way that you can think about experimentation, particularly at the scale, is sort of on the optimization side. So let's say you're building a new product. Let's just pick any new product. Um, what are the odds that you built that product perfectly the first try, right? And so one way to look at it is like if you plot all possible variants of that thing against the performance of that thing, like sales or whatever that might be, um, you launch and you have one data point, right? Let's say you run a second test. Now you have two data points. That doesn't give you much to go on, right? You have no idea the shape of that curve. Like it could be really anything, right? So by rapidly iterating, rapidly testing, you kind of uh, figure out where your maxima are, what, how to maximize your, your value. And that's a really big competitive advantage for some of these companies that have the traffic to run experimentations at, at great scale, like, like eBay. Um, OK, so the next thing, running experiments at this kind of scale is hard. Um, 
uh, very, very hard. <laughs> uh, and there's really a lot of ways that these programs can go very wrong. Um, and so I'll just go over a couple of them. Um, there can be biases that can apply, like confirmation bias, selection bias. There's assignment issues. I know Chris is giving a talk later on uh, sort of hashing algorithms, but there's definitely ways you can screw this up pretty easily. Um, there's statistical issues like sample ratio mismatches, multiple exposures. You can apply p-value corrections incorrectly. You can do variance reduction techniques to try to maximize your performance. Um, Windsorization to kind of remove outliers, all kinds of things. Um, when you do metrics, the types of metrics you use change the types of statistics you use. Um, and that can be non-intuitive, particularly if you're using quantiles or ratio metrics. Um, and then it's just decision risk, right? So in that build versus buy decision, if you build it yourself and you've been using it for, say, two years, and now you discovered a bug in your statistics, uh, you're in trouble because you just invalidated two years worth of decisions. Um, that does happen more frequently than you would people care to admit. Um, and not to mention, like, dealing with the data for uh, this kind of scale is extremely hard. So um, it's, it's, it's hard. And it's also extremely expensive. Um, some companies we spoke to spend millions of dollars a month just maintaining their experimentation platform. Um, I'm sure the eBay team, I don't know how much you spend, but it's probably a lot. Um, and yeah, and people spend millions. Um, so the goal of a lot of these companies when they're running this level of experiments is to bring the incremental cost per experiment as close to zero as possible. And um, so th what they all tend to do is if you plot, uh, I like my graphs, um, if you plot experimentation sophistication across company size, what you tend to see is all the companies, kind of the large companies are up here. They have very, very sophisticated programs. Uh, I didn't put eBay on here, sorry guys. Um, but all of these companies self-build their own tools, right? Um, and they do that because it just gets, like the scales get kind of wild and the economics get kind of weird. Um, this is where open source tools are great because you can, um, you can save a lot of money. Um, and what we tend to see is that there's commercial tools kind of there, like usually less sophisticated. They don't kind of work for higher end use cases. And then you end up with this kind of life cycle where companies will require a certain scale before they can graduate to the kind of more advanced testing. Because they have to build teams, they have to uh, have data science internally. Um, there's a little bit of like a wilderness area up here where no one has tools for that. Uh, again, another great area for open source. And, and we feel at Growthbook that we can kind of get people to a higher sophistication of experimentation much earlier in their company journey. Um, Anyway, I'm not, it's not an ad for us. But um, feature flagging is also a great way to scale testing because you're already choosing how to do assignment. And so that kind of really keeps the incremental costs very, very low. This is just like a high level architectural diagram of how Growthbook does it. But I'm sure this is the same for eBay and really any other feature flagging platform where um, like the feature flag is pushed down. You're already making decisions about assignment. So you just do the assignment. You then track however you're already tracking data and pull that in. Um, it's probably how eBay does this too. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the experiment journey. So there's like a framework we like to look at experimentation programs um, from the kind of crawl, walk, run uh, phase. So usually companies start off crawling. They'll just get some basic analytics. Uh, they're not really running any A-B tests yet. Then they start walking. So then you're doing you know, a couple tests here and there. Um, you then start running. So you'll uh, start having really common experimentation. Uh, maybe you have a growth team at this point. You're, kind of more accepting of experiments, particularly in important areas of your product. And then you're kind of flying, right? So this is where there's ubiquitous experimentation. Experimentation is actually more the, the norm of how you run experiments. And this is where like your, your big, big companies that do experimentation well are. Um, I was just, uh, anyone go to code at MIT this year? Um, so Netflix presented a talk or a paper there where they kind of predicted the experiment impact and like how many experiments they should be running. And they decided that they should do three orders of magnitude increase in the number of experiments they're running. Right? So it's 1,000x, uh, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. Um, so they're trying to build a platform that will support that. And I think there's going to be some technical problems with that. But um, you just also not cancel shows. Maybe that would work. Um, cool. OK, so the top companies really test everything they ship. Um, LinkedIn tests down to the pixel. Uh, and, um, and so in order to do that, you, kind of, you have to uh, add A-B testing to how you build product. So let's just take a little quick detour into how 
developer teams. Everyone's a software engineer? Most people? Yes, okay. Um, you're probably familiar with something like this. This is Agile Scrum. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different systems. I'm a little allergic to these kinds of things, but um, there's, the, this is, uh, I can't even read it. This is um, Lean Agile Scaling. And uh, if this is your process, I, I feel very sorry for you. Um, this is Accenture. If you can pay them a lot of money, they'll generate this for you. Um, and if you look at like the, the, the landscape of, of Agile and Scrum frameworks, uh, and I looked at a lot of these, one of the things that's very interesting is that they're all missing the definition of done. Um, usually done means shipped, right? Or maybe the, the product owner accepts it or it's done the story points or whatever it is. Um, but like it's an increment, right? Like, well, okay, who cares about increments? Does your software, does your company run on increments? No, it does not. Um, so what you really want to do is add A-B testing as a way to validate the, the thing that you, the increment that you built um, and that each product that you build kind of defines success for that. So um, what you end up is something like this. So like at the beginning of the project, you kind of think like, what's the hypothesis I'm trying to test? Uh, what are the actions that a user would do in order to determine if that hypothesis is correct or incorrect? And then what kind of metrics would I need to measure for that? And then what's the smallest thing I can build to validate if that is correct or incorrect? Um, now, uh, I, I call this ham. This is not a thing, by the way. I'm trying to make it a thing, but um, here's, here's John Ham. Um, uh, so then if they have the traffic, they will then run that test, right? So what you end up is kind of a modified process. It looks a little bit like this, where at the beginning of the life cycle, you kind of scope it down to the MVP, and you think of the hypothesis and the success criteria. And then at the end of the process, you run an A-B test, and then you see if it meets the success criteria or not, and you do the win-loss decision. Maybe you'll do an experiment review meeting um, and kind of present the results. Uh, when you do the success criteria up front, it's really great because you don't get those kind of weird meetings where you're like, what do we do? Um, because you've already decided that up front. Um, and it's a good way to remove ambiguity. I've been in too many meetings that are a waste of time. But anyway, um, so let's take a look at ex experimentation program structures. So what we see is companies usually start with like an isolated team. They'll start with one team or a couple of people on the team that run tests, and they're going to do a small number of tests, usually a couple a month. Um, and that's OK. It's generally better than not running any tests, but it's not really great because it's just hard to scale it. You're really isolated. You're not really learning from the team. And you're just not going to run a high enough frequency to get meaningful results unless your product is like really under-optimized. Um, so then people graduate to these other uh, platforms. And so um, I'm going to talk about three of them. I don't have a dog in this. I'm just going to talk about three programs that we've seen uh, on how people run. And all of these run at really high scale. Um, so that you get the centralized experiment team. This is common at like Microsoft, where there's one central team that oversees all experimentation. In fact, all experiments have to be turned on and turned off by that team, uh, which is interesting. Um, so well, the good news is that it's really easy to kind of manage all the metrics uh, there and kind of make sure that there's consistency and best practices across how you apply statistics. Um, the bad news is that this can often be a bottleneck, right? So that team can only run so many tests. And if you want to scale, you have to hire more people to run more tests. Um, so then we see a decentralized approach where kind of each team has their own tool. Uh, and they can design and run their own experiment. That's a great way to kind of scale up the amount of experiments you can run. Um, and so each team has the autonomy to kind of make decisions. Um, but there's really no way to share standards across teams in this situation. Um, sometimes you can have even interacting experiments depending on how you divide your teams. And then it can get very, very expensive. So sometimes the teams will have a data scientist per team. Um, we also see center of excellence so that uh, this is probably if I had to pick one, this is what I would pick, where there's sort of your experimentation team that advises the other teams on how to do their experiments well. So the autonomy is still in the teams, but the center of excellence is like helping companies improve their experimentation. Um, this way, they can ensure common tooling, common uh, uh, statistics and best practices. Um, the other nice thing is that you're actually training people on how to run experiments instead of um, just letting them run experiments and telling them they're wrong. Um, and that actually means that those people are like transferable across teams and across the entire company. 
Um, the slight con is that it requires a lot of diligence in making sure that everyone's running their tests correctly. And uh, data science needs a lot of patience. I don't know how many times I've explained what a p-value is to folks, but you will invariably explain it again. Um, so that kind of sucks. But OK, so um, in conclusion, um, the takeaways here, I, I mentioned more. I'm just giving the highlight of the top five here. Without experimentation, you're really guessing. So if you're not running experimentation, you really should be. Um, companies that do this very well have a very, very high frequency of tests, like tens of thousands of experiments. And they do that for a competitive advantage, so they can iterate quickly, they can learn quickly, and they can outcompete people that don't do that. Um, running experiments at that kind of scale, however, is very, very hard, and is fraught with a lot of problems. Um, and all of them are trying to really bring the incremental cost per experiment down to zero, if they can. Uh, feature flags is a great way to do that. And um, yeah, then they choose the experimentation system that works best for them, um, usually one of those. Uh, recommended reading, if you haven't read it already, Ronnie Covey literally wrote the book on this. I highly recommend it. It's very good. He has a class as well. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Chayden, you're up, and we got time for probably like one or two questions, so go ahead, Chayden. Yeah, uh, uh, in the last slide, you mentioned that uh, we can bring down the cost of experiment to zero, and you kind of hinted at feature flags. Can you maybe elaborate on that point, and is there anything else besides feature flag as well? Just curious. Uh, so there's a whole bunch on the data engineering side that you can do, um, like pre-aggregation of metrics. Uh, most of the programs at these scales are using DBT to do a lot of pre-aggregation and incremental updates for their statistics. Um, that's probably the biggest way to do it. The bulk of the cost is in data. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I would probably cry if I saw your data bill. But um, yeah, it's, it's mostly on that side. The engineering side, once you're using feature flags, is just trivially easy. You're probably already doing it. It's, it's like one line of code. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and one last question. Have you seen uh, a common methodology in use for determining the statistically significant size of a testing group and like do you ever see tests like false positives tests that indicated that a, an iteration would be successful and what was what? the first part question do we ever use um it like is there a common methodology for choosing oh, the size of size, the experiment uh, like body of there's users? no common common way to do it uh, it really depends on the f statistics you're using if it's bayesian sequential frequentist um, how you choose your minimum sample size. And there is a false positive rate. It is chosen by the p-value you choose to accept and like the amount of risk you would like to accept as your company. Um, companies usually choose 0.05%, which means about 5% of the time your tests are going to be false positive. That's kind of industry standard. There's been some new pushes in the industry to kind of actually increase that to go kind of so that your p-value closer to like 0.4, which is like kind of a little radical. You're getting a lot of false positives at that rate, but like the chances they're like, well, you're going to have more wins and losses if you just scale it up. That'll be a good positive effect. But uh, I don't have a huge dog in the fight. That's a little bit controversial. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that's not a great way to do it. Amazing. Uh, so I think we've we got about 45 seconds left, so probably not enough time to answer a question now. But if you've got more questions for Graham, Graham, you're going to be sticking around. Yep. Um, and I think there's an awesome event that Growthbook and Signals are doing tonight. And so yep. you'll be able to find kind of Graham up until that point. Um, so uh, yeah, huge round of applause for Graham. Thank you so much.